Welcome to another episode of A Founder's Journey into Bitcoin. Today, I'm joined by Leonidas, Leonidas co-founder and CEO of Ord.io, and he's also a pioneer in attributes. And I am Albert, CEO of Bitcoin Startup Lab. Uh, this is the Who's Who and Founder's Journey into Bitcoin interview series, where the Bitcoin community has come together to celebrate innovative and significant achievements on Bitcoin so that we can reinforce and grow the innovation culture on Bitcoin. And so when we say significant achievements on Bitcoin, it means that things that were done for the first time ever on Bitcoin are setting a new record uh, to push for the innovation frontier on Bitcoin. And this show is brought to you by CryptoSlate. They are a crypto agnostic media platform that brings the latest happenings on Bitcoin to the rest of the crypto world. And the Bitcoin Startup Lab, a top pre accelerator in the Bitcoin ecosystem where we help you turn your ideas into investment ready startups. And before we get started, I'd love to say a big thank you to our teams and all the guest speakers that come together to make this show possible and accelerate the advent of the Bitcoin economy. So this is show number 16. We are on a mission to, to uh, reach 30 innovators by the end of the year. The time is getting tight. We might have to make a cut at 20, but I'm thrilled to have Leonidas, co-founder and CEO of Ord.io, who is pioneering his attributes uh, on Ordinals. Uh, join us for um, the 16th Who's Who episode. So hi, Leonidas. How are you doing? Hey, Albert. Super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Always, always love getting to chat with you. Yeah, likewise, likewise. And and uh, I, I think um, it like I think it's safe to say on behalf of the Bitcoin community, thanks for uh, being the longest running show for Ordinals. So it has become an important part of our Bitcoin culture. And also thank you for uh, helping and spearheading attributes on, on ordinals and creating sensibility, right? In the in the rare set market. Um, and I'd also like to get into Ord.io, but before we get into the main event, um, can we start from the top and maybe understand how you guys started even before university days? And like what did you, did you do any side hustles um, or something to that that sort of showed your entrepreneur spirit at a, at a young age? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. I don't actually think I've talked about this a whole lot, maybe ever <laughs> uh, publicly before. Um, I so I like started a you can call it a business, but not really. It's like I had a lawnmower. And I went around to like a thousand different houses in my like broader neighborhood. Uh, this is like maybe when I was like 15 and just dropped off little pamphlets and all the mailboxes. And then, you know, a few of them called back and were like, yeah, like you can, you know, mow our lawn. So I would drive around, drive around on uh, Saturdays for a few years, uh, hitting, hitting a bunch of houses and just mowing their lawns and blowing their driveway. So I don't really know, like, that's not like, I'm not sure how that translated exactly into what I'm doing today, but it was cool to like get out there and actually like, you know, earn some money and like do your own thing. You definitely learn. Uh, there's, there's definitely like things you learn through just that process, I guess. So yeah, like uh, lawn mowing is like, I think probably the most stereotypical, like, you know, kind of side hustle you can do as a kid, but yeah, I definitely, <laughs> definitely enjoyed, uh, you know, getting to kind of, I don't know, doing, owning something yourself and owning the outcome is like, it's it's an important step for people to take right like you don't necessarily always want to be working for other people uh, it's nice to kind of do your own thing even if it's you know just you and a lot more <laughs> yeah no but yeah i mean i i guess you encapsulate all the all the basic components of a startup or a business right you had to do the marketing uh you had to have a product right that created value <laughs> right and uh, you have to deliver that that um service at a quality where people invite you back um to reuse your product or service so so I, yeah I, i'd say it's good training you know i mean there's there's an overwhelming number of um of uh guest speakers who come on the who's who that have either done lawn mowing car washing delivering papers or some some kind of side hustle that required um both uh just hustling and marketing right sales and and in addition providing a service that people wanted uh when they were teenagers so yeah i i I love starting with that question because we're we're definitely trying to look for patterns and hopefully other people have done other, other side hustles when they're young. Maybe they um it, it helps trigger 
something in them and they realize like, hey, you know, maybe they have the entrepreneur gene, you know? So thanks for sharing that with us. Hope that's an, an inspiration to some people. So after 15, you said it for a few years, um, what was the next side hustle you did? Um, I, I don't know if you qualify this as a side hustle, but silly bands were another pretty popular thing. I like, quite, like <laughs> there was this period of time, uh, I don't know if this is happening all around the world, but in the US, where these like little silly bands, which were these like cute shaped like animals that you would like have a rubber band shaped in that you would, you know, collect and, you know, wear around your arm. And uh, I don't even, this might've been even before the lawn mowing, to be honest, I can't remember, but I, uh, you know, got really into like trading and, you know, built up a pretty good collection just by like making good trades with people. I always collected Pokemon cards when I was like much younger, uh, you know, collected coins would go to the flea market and, uh, you know, kind of check out all the different coins here. The guy behind the stand would always have like this amazing story for like pretty much every coin, right? They all have some sort of like interesting narrative or story and I uh, got into collecting through that. So I've always like collecting is not really a side hustle. Like I, I was probably like, you know, more just like collecting not to make money just because these are cool things to have. But I, I really did, uh, you know, I, I think the, those early coin collecting days probably in some way did translate into you know, okay, this is just collecting digital coins when I like came across Bitcoin uh, back in right. the Let me ask a question. How old are you then? What grade were you in? Uh, I mean, coin yes. collecting, second grade, maybe. Pokemon oh, man. Card, Shoot, that's grade. Uh, hold on. Is that, you're saying you're seven? Probably, yeah. Yeah, I was pretty uh -oh. like these coin collections. Like my coin collection and my Pokemon card collection, I spent like all my time like, you know, doing inventory, like <laughs> calculating, you know, all the different uh, like cards that I had and like just trying to keep uh, keep inventory of what I had and like trying to add to the collection. That's interesting. That's an interesting point. I, I, I found a lot of my friends who are successful founders, they they tend to understand the value of things at a, at a fairly young age. You know, there's like, you know, for some reason that, that part like for, for other people the part of the brain that develops maybe other things right but I, I noticed that for like successful founders the the value of things becomes very clear at a, at a younger age so that's that's interesting to know so that's se basically seven okay and then what, what did you collect pokemon cards yeah yeah like pokemon cards uh these were like the kind of older like 1996 1997 1998 pokemon cards more and then yeah, like basically coins, like old U.S. coins, like currency from many different countries. Uh, you know, like, you know, it's not like I had this crazy collection. Like to me at the time, I was really young. Like the collection was probably worth like $50. But you can, you know, get a lot of really cool uh, coins for $50, it turns out, right? Like, you know, wheat pennies are, are pretty interesting. I had a bunch of those. And I don't know, like, yeah, it's just. Uh, okay, it's, I'm going to. It's this fun thing to do where I guess it's not that different from NFT collecting that you would maybe do more as an adult. It's just like the very like baby uh, kind of like initial version of that. And there's of course coin collectors who take it really, really seriously today. And I'm, I'm not one of those, but there's, there's a whole world there that went way over my head <laughs> at the time. Yeah, of course, yeah, you could go really deep in coin collection, but let me, let me ask a question, which, which one of those uh, collectibles was the most interactive being that you had the highest frequency of other people owning a, a similar collectible and then you can trade with them um i wasn't doing too much trading of the pokemon cards and the coins it was more uh kind of just like me building up my collection i would like you know you can you know talk to kids at school about it i guess but i think pokemon was like i think it's I, like most of the kids collected Yu-Gi-Oh, and i was more interested in collecting like, the older pokemon cards rather than like the new kind of hot uh Yu -Gi -Oh stuff so like the kids bringing you to school i don't know yeah it's, it's a good question i think pokemon just like seemed uh just like way uh way cooler to me like it was it was just a neat uh this neat idea of like catching pokemon right i, I watched the pokemon tv show and you know didn't play the video games but was into pokemon so That's yeah it, it's an interesting it's an, maybe Yu -Gi -Oh was like a little older kids than me uh, at the time i guess Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So we covered 
coin collection, Pokemon, the uh, the wrist animal wrist bracelets, right, and then also their your um, lawn mowing business. Um, let's let's go on to the next one, right? What's what's the you know be, before you came into um, ordinals, you were in the Ethereum space. Did you do anything before you got into Web three between the lawn mowing business and and um, you run in Ethereum? Well, um, <laughs> yes. I don't. I don't talk about my personal life <laughs> a lot. I. I mean, I went to college. I was a pretty big runner. I, um, you know, I ended up, you know, leaving college. I dropped out of college and uh, moved out to California and moved into this like hacker house and started teaching myself to code. And at the time I was like, you know, delivering DoorDash on my bike and just like trying to make ends meet month to month. And then, you know, during, during the nights I would teach myself to code and was able to get a few kind of basic contract jobs and eventually was able to, uh, you know, get some contract jobs in web three. And then I created some, uh, kind of early apps on the app store in the crypto space. This is all back in like 2017 and yeah, basically just played around with Ethereum and all the fun things happening at the time and just got totally sucked in during that, you know, the rise of Ethereum in like 2017 was like a super, super special moment uh, for the people who kind of remember that it was, uh, the feeling was just, I don't know, it, it's very similar to the ordinals feeling of just people were like super excited about just this incredible opportunity that we get to all be part of and help shape. So like I got to see crypto punks come out, you know, of course I thought they were stupid, <laughs> didn't buy them, <laughs> but I, I played crypto kitties and I did, I did dig crypto kitties. Like this idea of the ERC 721 standard definitely clicked with me. And I, uh, you know, got to check out OpenSea when it came out and just, I don't know, getting to like tinker and play with a bunch of stuff, you know, at the time was definitely, uh, you know, what helped me kind of have a passion for this space and just, I don't know, being able to interact in a space where you do whatever you want to really, uh, there's no, uh, you know, there's no middleman, right? Like this idea of you just like playing this game with other people through a smart contract with crypto kitties, like that was a really fun idea to me. And I kind of wish gaming, <laughs> I would have assumed gaming would have taken off a lot more, uh, maybe since I played CryptoKitties in 2017. I think there's still hope, but, you know, we haven't made as much progress on that front. But the idea of NFTs and then DeFi definitely really took off, uh, you know, 2020, 2021, and got really doubled down on, on crypto at that point in time, and uh, kind of fully immersed myself uh, back into the space. I had gone and worked for just uh, large tech companies and a startup in San Francisco, uh, kind of in the in-between bear market part of the crypto, like 2018, 2019, 2020 days. Oh, interesting. So let me start from the top there. Did I hear it correctly? You're working, um, doing DoorDash to make ends meet while you're learning how to code. Yeah, dude, it's funny. Oh, like, that's a hustle. I'm like sleeping in a house with like bunk beds. There's like six people per room, you know, like, Literally just biking around. So it's like a hostel, it's like a hostel, but like a hacker house. It's a hostel, yeah. Like there <laughs> were bed bugs. It was a complete disaster. Like, but yeah, I, I did. I did go through all that and like you know basically moved out to California and was like you know I've got like three thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin and I'm just gonna like see if I can teach myself the code and like you know end up becoming a, a software developer and hopefully building you know something in the space someday. So. You know, here we are, I guess, six years later and, you know, kind of wow. kind of following, I guess, that initial vision a little bit. All right. And then so and then you hit like the 2017, the beginnings of Ethereum and on the side. Well, I, was, I was actually like a Bitcoin maxi, right? Like I, you know, I held Bitcoin. I thought Ethereum was like really stupid, you know, just very obvious bag bias. And then I had a friend uh, buy ETH at like $12 and, and tell me and this is a friend I respected. and. I think I ended up buying some ETH at like 70 bucks and, you know, got to ride that wave. So I would say the most, the most beneficial thing you can do to like a Bitcoin maxi to convince them uh, that, you know, maybe there's other things other than Bitcoin that are also cool, like other than the BTC currency um, is to just like get people to actually try and use these things. Cause as, as soon as you have, you know, a rare Pepe or an inscription or a rare sat in your wallet, all of a sudden you're on that team. It's just like, this is how incentive alignment works, right? I was a, you know, Bitcoin maxi and hated Ethereum. 
like the only reason, like if I'm being honest with myself, was because you know Bitcoin is what I held and I didn't hold ETH, and I was seeing this thing going up and feeling like jealous that like I wasn't getting to participate in this upside. So finally, I was just like, the logical <laughs> here is there is a pretty interesting technological innovation with these smart contracts. I'll move like 20% of my Bitcoin into ETH. And I think that was the logical thing to do. And then I, I, you know, as a developer, there wasn't a whole lot to do on Bitcoin and there was tons to do on Ethereum. So, you know, ended up being more attracted to that space. Yeah, it's, thanks for sharing that. And you said you're working for some tech startups. I mean, all the while you're on the side, you're still um, playing around and become basically becoming a super user on Ethereum, right? Is, yeah, is I mean, building... I've built a bunch of random stuff. Maybe if I get docs someday, I can talk about it. Nothing like super crazy, but I've, yeah, I've, <laughs> I've hacked together a lot of side projects over the past like five or six years. Can you um, share like not the name, but like, like what the categories are? Are they like, uh, uh, like crypto stuff, social stuff, social uh, stuff, social uh, stuff. Okay. design stuff, just all kinds of stuff. Like go to product hunt and just scroll through people's side projects. It's things like that. Right. Yeah, and, and you're you're doing like this like as a as like um in your free time when you're working full time for those startups. Right. right. I definitely, you know, liked when I got to decide what I wanted to work on. Like I enjoyed that more than you know working for other people, probably. Yeah, no, as as every single entrepreneur and founder like like finds out, right? It's like we we there's like this innate passion to to um, sort of imagine something that's really cool and to want to build it. Um, yeah, I mean, as a software developer, most software developers are in this old code base, you know, fixing, you know, this infinite pile of bugs that are coming in, maintaining like all of this crappy old tech that's like so outdated and nobody's talking about. And then there's like all this new, like sick bleeding edge stuff happening. Of course, you're like on your nights and weekends, you're working on the cool stuff, right? You're not <laughs> like, you know, I think there's a lot of people and it's an important job that software developers need to maintain all these code bases. It's what makes the world function, but it's not exactly like, like there's interesting problems to solve, right? But the actual tech itself is like a decade old. It's not as exciting to work with like the kind of, you know, you know, you can do this like way more efficiently today with like a new tech stack and it's much more fun to be working with the bleeding edge stuff. Yeah, no, is I mean, I mean, you're in Bitcoin now, but that must have been, I mean, so you start you start writing smart contracts. Um, you became a super user, right? Um, you mentioned in 2018, 19, and was it 2020 that you were still working at startups in San Francisco? Like what? What? At that, what, at that time, that? I was working in a larger uh, tech company and worked there until September of 2021. Okay, so between 2021, is that's roughly two years. Right. I mean, we just passed. Yeah. So what happened in this last two years? And you left, like, obviously you left that company and then just walk us through like the highlights on how you um, eventually got into the ordinal space. So high level, you know, 2020, late 2020 rolls around. It's starting to get on my radar. People are pinging me that, you know, NFTs are looking like they're going to become a thing again. Uh, you know, I had, I had kind of checked out of the NFT kind of scene for the prior two years for the most part. And it was just this kind of clear feeling that we're probably going to have just yet another one of these massive bull runs. And it's probably just starting to kick off and it's, you know, we're timed up pretty nicely with the four year cycles. So I took, uh, I took all the money that I had saved up and uh, just from working as a software developer for the past few years, put it into uh, the two uh, you know, like oldest NFTs that I was aware of, which was a CryptoPunk and a founder CryptoKitty, and then some ETH and a few DeFi tokens, and just started, uh, you know, getting more and more into NFTs. And, you know, basically, uh, I think around March of 2021, I was listening to this clubhouse space, uh, this clubhouse room, and they were talking about rediscovering this old smart contract from 2017 called the Mooncat Rescue Smart Contract. And it turns out there were these 24,000 cats that, you know, had just been sitting there in this old smart contract that were, you know, at the time, it was the third smart contract that I was aware of in 2017 that had NFTs in it. So my thesis was already pretty strong on, uh, you know, 2017 early Ethereum NFTs. To me, that was always just way cooler than uh, the kind of newer market that I just didn't understand at all. So I, uh, you know, 
listened to that space and I was a little too late uh, by the time I tuned into the space they'd already all been claimed and I just kind of sat there and like put two and two together in my head that you know okay you know this this project this smart contract is from 2017 and it has you know a bunch of nfts in it the market cap is zero dollars and you know 12 hours into this kind of rescue the market cap goes to 100 million dollars and i'm like that's incredible there's 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 value sitting on the chain to be found right and i got off the space i got off the clubhouse room i hopped on my computer and i just looked for like three hours straight for old nft projects and I came across this project called Digital Zones of Immaterial Pictorial Sensibility on uh, like this, it was like the seventh page of like a really custom Google search. And it, it wasn't like called NFTs, right? It was more like digital art on Ethereum. And yeah, ended up- uh, Seventh page on a Google search, geez. So you're on a mission. I was on a mission. I wanted to see if I could find old smart contracts that had, you know, NFTs in them. And it was able to do that. And you know, it was able to collect a few of those. and. Those ended up, uh, you know, being a you know really interesting collection, and there ended up being even more smart contracts from 2017 that, uh, you know, a bunch of people were, you know, really into. There was this historical NFT community starting to grow at the time, and people, you know, basically NFTs are going through price discovery in a like pretty rapid, you know, six to twelve month period of time. So um, I was in the more historical early NFT researching uh, collecting group of people, and yeah, basically got to a massive collection of, you know, you know, NFTs from like hundreds of old smart contracts, NFTs from Namecoin, NFTs from Bitcoin in the early counterparty days. And yeah, I, I still have that historical NFT collection. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I basically became Leonidas. Like I created the Leonidas account in, I think like August, I switched to like being Leonidas in August of 2021. And yeah, basically now I guess like I'm like the technical term is like an NFT influencer. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically say, through, NFT, through all of that, I met Casey in like the next summer and cause he was coming into the historical NFT discord pitching, you know, rare sats as being the oldest NFTs ever because he had made right. sounds non-fungible. And if you believe sats are non-fungible when looking through this lens, it means that theoretically, like the first SATs from 2009 are technically the oldest NFTs. And I don't really think that like technically holds too much merit necessarily. Like, I don't think it's quite the same as an NFT in that sense, because it wasn't initially conceived to be an NFT and wasn't technically an NFT at the time, but it was nonetheless like super interesting. So I had a you know call with uh, Casey and just got to grill him on a bunch of different things about this and realized like, wow, this guy's like super smart. He's got a pretty legit protocol. And if he creates, you know, some sort of interface for people to interact with this, like it's probably going to be pretty interesting. And yeah, here we are, you know, like Ordinals got released earlier this year and I got to, you know, check out inscriptions uh, like sub 100 and, you know, met like Trevor on a space when there were like, you know, a thousand inscriptions and uh, have just been, you know, full steam ahead Ordinals uh, pretty much ever since then. I, I saw there was clearly something pretty awesome happening here. Yeah, no, I, I mean, there's a bunch of questions that pop into my mind. Like first, uh, for you know, I'd like to point out that, you know, I, it seems like you've been in the Web3 space for like a full two cycles now, right? Like two four-year cycles. Yeah, so in, and, yeah, like, I guess 2013, my computer science teacher, you know, taught me about Bitcoin. And then I, you know, when the price went down in 2014, I picked up a few Bitcoin and then just kind of held that didn't really understand too much. It was more just like speculative investment, but kind of got to, got to watch just this brutal, you know, check, check the prices every day from 2014 into like, you know, 2016 was pretty, pretty tough. Like it was, uh, bouncing around 200, $300 <laughs> and, you know, like there's literally like, we're talking the market cap of Bitcoin is, you know, like $4 billion or something like th the space is non-existent. Right. There's like a few, like that's the size of like, there's a lot of, go look at an L1 that has a $4 billion market cap. Like that was the size of the entire crypto space at the time, right? There just, there wasn't a whole lot really going on there. Um, and yeah, it came out of that. And I think you got to really hand it to Vitalik with Ethereum for, 
uh, just starting this just whole renaissance of blockchain technology it isn't just currency, it's all these other applications. And the general purpose smart contracts was just a huge innovation that, you know, unleashed all of these ICOs and craziness. So yeah, it's, it's been interesting going through a few of these now, like, you know, the, the bear market, like doesn't phase me as much just because I've kind of watched the same thing happen over and over. And it's like, it's kind of like, of course, we're in a brutal bear market. Of course, everyone's capitulating, I guess. Uh, but the, the great thing about that is there's a lot of people who've also been through these before and they, you know, have this just, you know, almost delusional conviction that like, you know, in my head, and it, this is probably irrational, but there's like this 99.99% chance that in a year and a half from now, we have a massive bull run again, and everything in the space goes up like 10 to 20 X, right? And I, like, I'm not saying that's, you know, healthy to like have delusional conviction on that, but that's how it's always been. And I think it has to do with just uh, the market psychology of, of, of just this completely free market that is super volatile. So yeah, I don't think uh, like I was definitely like a lot more nervous than maybe in the earlier kind of bear markets. And then this one, just, I'm not, not really sweating it too much. It's, it's almost kind of boring, <laughs> a little too predictable. Okay. Yeah. That, that's actually my next question, right? So from these, you know, you've seen two cycles, right? Uh, before, I mean, I, I wanted to sort of get some insights. I think the audience is curious too. Um, if if it follows the same pattern as the previous um, bear and bull run cycle uh, for Web3 crypto, like how much longer do we have to wait for this one? But before you answer that, I'm just curious, did you sell any NFTs at the height of the of the bull run? Uh, in um, Is this end of, it's basically a, beginning of 2022 right end of 2021 I mean, yeah not enough uh ironically it's it's really interesting like i would have been way better off probably never creating this leonidas account i think people kind of assume nft kind of people in the space like influencers you know make their money by like leveraging uh their like you know uh ability to do like paid promotion and releasing things and stuff and i've never released uh uh anything and pretty much made like made my money in the space before I was Leonidas. Uh, so, you know, basically everything I collected after that point, I basically was like learning on the fly as like this 25 year old, you can basically only buy and never sell anything. Like that's, that is like the kind of general rule for an NFT influencer. Um, and I've kind of like more so learned that, but yeah, I mean, basically I've, you know, held that entire collection and I've ridden everything down to like basically the bottom of this bear market. Um, and, and definitely should have taken a lot more off the table. Like looking back, yeah, like I definitely should have set, set aside, a, you know, a lot of, a lot more money. I shouldn't be, shouldn't be so illiquid in JPEGs, but you know, this is, this is. This Hard is though, you, you got the responsibility, right, of um, holding your, your good name up as an Yeah, I mean, after you tweet about something, right, it's, uh, it's kind of like, you just basically realize like, and I, and I really do understand, like, you just probably don't sell, like after you tweeted about it. So if you are going to sell something, just don't ever talk about it. And, and that's pretty much the rule. Uh, I think, you know, you kind of need to follow. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point. So, hey, everyone in the audience, we're about the halfway point. We're going to take another 15 minutes to dive into um, um, how the United Spirit adding attributes, what it means for uh, rare sats and also um, dive into or.io. So if you guys hear anything that piques your interest, you guys want to raise a hand, we are going to go into a Q&A session in about 15, 20 minutes here. So, so get ready for that. So, all right. Um, but before we jump into that, I'm still very curious, right? We're, um, well, I think you posted the other day, less than a week ago, with like 35 million inscriptions, right? So, and, 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 and Danny from OCM posted that the growth rate for inscriptions is faster than, than um, what the NFT market had, had grown out in the beginning, right? Um, so, yeah, I know it's not exactly, my point is like the market force is not exactly the same from, um, you know, every four year cycle, but what do you think is similar? And, and because we're sort of, we, we've, um, the activity has, has definitely gone down, but, but um, there's still a lot of activity, right? Um, how long do you think we have, if, you know, if you're taking experience from the previous cycles, how, how much longer are we going to, is it going to take the bottom out and then come back out of it and then, go into like a bull run? So yeah, to answer this question, I think we have to be super honest that 
the reason the market cap for the space right now is like a trillion dollars has nothing to do with like real utility. It's like mostly still like 95% of it has to do with people speculating on maybe future utility or a future, you know, store of value or future use cases. But a lot of, a lot of the space is people basically being angel investors, speculating on things. And in that world, you know, you know, the psychology of the market just completely drives everything. So, you know, when everybody's FOMOing in, it just goes to really insane heights. And then when everybody's capitulating, you dive really low and you just have this absurd, uh, you know, difference between like the energy a year and a half ago and the energy now is just very, very different. So we've seen this play out like, you know, 2013 is a peak, you know, bull run, just completely crazy for Bitcoin. And then like 2015, like 24, 2015, 2016 are pretty brutal. 2016, you're starting to get some pulse back. 2017 is just a crazy year. And then you repeat the same thing. It's like 2018 was, you know, super brutal. 2019, just so brutal. ETH hits, ETH hits like $89, right? Like this is, you know, absolute, like people are basically like believing Ethereum's completely toast uh, at $89, right? Um, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty bad, pretty bad vibes. And then of course you come out of it and all these builders that get funded the previous cycle are building and working really hard during the bear market. And then it just turns out, I think it's mostly a function of people talk about happenings, but I think, I think it's really just a function of like, how long does it take? You know, you give a thousand startups, you know, a million dollars or a few million dollars or something, uh, you know, have them build during, you know, a bear market. It takes them a year or two to really shift like products and like iterate to the point where the ideas that people were funding and very, very speculatively, thinking might be the future. It takes us several years for people to actually build that into a practical product that you know meets users' needs. And that usually seems to be like roughly a four-year cycle of uh, that happening. And I think it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't help that we've had these four-year cycles like quite a few times now. So there's also this self-fulfilling prophecy of, you know, people just think the psychology is everybody thinks this is going to be in four-year cycles and thus it becomes four-year cycles. I genuinely don't think it has anything to do with the economics of like less Bitcoin, you know, being, you know, less sell pressure from miners of like their, you know, Bitcoin rewards. Like, I don't think it has anything to do with that. That might've initially been what kickstarted the psychology, but yeah, it's a combination of self-fulfilling prophecy uh, and builders having to just actually take all that capital that flowed in during 2021 and turn it into practical products that actually that, you know, people want to use on the internet. So we are, we're, we're in like, uh, you know, the 2019 phase right now. Like this is, if you're mapping these things over each other, if you were here in 2019, uh, around, you know, October, 2019, you know, that's, that's the spot that we're at in this. So we still got a little bit, we like, we're talking, you know, DeFi summer is still nine months off, you know, the, and that's like really the first real pulse of energy coming back to the space would be like nine months from now. So again, this is all completely made up <laughs> bogus information. Yeah, no, well, no, this is, this is um, what I was asking, right? If we, if we had to base it on the last cycle, then yeah. okay, that's, that's insightful. So another nine months, I, I, I tend to roughly agree with that timing, just um, running the Bitcoin startup lab and look, you know, just as seeing the, what, what the founders are building through our, you know, through our program and, even like this, this court when people are, are applying, yeah, I'd say in about nine months from now, some of these DeFi products are going to be, you know, like you said, um, user production level ready. Um, yeah, and and yeah, that, I think that that's roughly right, man. I I, I hope that the economy um, also supports that at that time. But let's let's go back to um, let's get to into the attributes, right? Thanks for sharing that, by the way. It, it shows that we, we're already um, halfway past this um, bear market. But um, Yeah, we're, we're through. I think we're through probably the really thick of the brutality, like, you know, the FTX and uh, Luna stuff, like all of, all of that mess uh, led us to like bottom, you know, in certain respects earlier than maybe we would have in prior bull markets. But yeah, we've just been kind of like NFTs have been kind of slowly going down, but the crypto space as a whole, I think, bottom when ETH hit like eight hundred dollars, and you know, Bitcoin went down to like maybe I don't know. I think it was like thirteen thousand. I think that was that was really the bottom. And uh, having that bottom, I think, behind us from the whole crypto perspective has actually been kind of nice 
Of course, it was brutal for people at the time who, you know, three months earlier were riding high, but instead of slowly going down for a long time, we bought them super fast. And now, I mean, you know, Bitcoin, Ether, like, you know, double the, the low point there, which is like a pretty nice spot to be in uh, during a bear market, to be honest. Yeah, no, I'm glad to hear that it's the worst is behind us. Um, I, I tend to agree with that. I mean, we never know what the future holds, but it, it, if it's uh, just judging from past cycles, it, it does feel like the worst is behind us. In, in any event, uh, the real builders come out during this time. Anyhow, um, historically speaking, I mean, in 2008, it, you know, we had what Airbnb and Uber come out of the ashes of that financial crisis. If you look at 1975, what two companies came out of that recession? Well, one was Apple, the other one was Microsoft. But actually, these are not outliers. This is actually the, the rule of thumb, right? Um, two thirds of publicly traded companies come out from recessions. But yet, uh, if you look at the percentage of time that recessions take up in the US economy, it's less than 20%. So that means 10x more powerful companies come out of recessions and bear markets than um, than during the bull market. So speaking of which, right, um, let's get into this Satchel or .io. Um, you're building the bear market, um, hats off to you. And, um, but you weren't always in the, when you started Bitcoin, you went to Ethereum, you met Casey last summer, right? If I heard correctly. Well, I guess it would be two summers ago now, but yeah. Two summers, well, two, well, two summers. Okay, so, so, it, all right, and then you made the transition uh, into basically, basically all Bitcoin early this year, right? February or January. Is that yeah, correct? I mean, I still hold a lot of Ethereum assets. I didn't yeah. like sell everything, but yeah, I have been focusing full time on specifically this like ordinal space. So, all right, so if it's, okay, so just so um, everyone in the audience, including myself, um, have our bearings, right? So it was two summers ago. So, okay, so a year and a half after you met Casey, like he actually launches this thing and it just takes off. Right? It's almost like a, it's seemingly from outsider's point of view, a overnight success, but you saw him struggle for a year and a half um, to get this off the ground. Can you share a little bit about that? And then eventually what was the, what was the tipping point for you to say, all right, I'm going to... Um, basically spend all my time in Bitcoin now and, you know, minimize the time I'm in Ethereum. What was that? Can, can you share like the, like what happened there and what was your, yeah. What was, what was the turning point there? So there were, there were people that were closer to Casey than I was. I was more like this kind of observer of something that I thought was interesting that was happening, you know, as an NFT, you know, collector, you're constantly just looking for, interesting things that are happening. This is like pretty much what people do all day in the crypto space. They're scrolling through Twitter. They're just looking for interesting things that are happening that they might want to invest in, right? And it's it's it was brutal. Like there were just constantly interesting things that I, you know, I could deploy capital every week during 2021. And by the time it's summer of 2022, I mean, I'm really struggling. I haven't bought anything for like three months. Like, like literally, I haven't bought or sold anything in three months because there's just nothing coming across uh, my Twitter feed that seems remotely interesting. And then, you know, Casey comes along and it's just like, wow, like this is actually a pretty novel thing. Uh, I had already had a thesis around Bitcoin. I held a bunch of and still hold a bunch of these early counterparty NFTs. And, you know, basically my, like, I think that the main thing I tried to convey to Casey was like, dude, everything you're saying is like actually like super legit. This all makes sense, but people are super, super lazy. So unless you like serve it up to them on a platter, you just can't get the, there's not enough devs like Casey out there to prop something up and make it happen. You know, I was like, you need to create some sort of like command line interface uh, that people can like in under an hour kind of get set up using this protocol. Otherwise it's just, it's just another idea that somebody has. Um, even though I think it's actually a legit idea and like pretty, pretty dope that you can, you know, buy and sell like rare stats. That's like pretty, pretty cool. Like people can sat hunt. He, he described all these things in, you know, his writing before I even met him that summer and, you know, articulated it, you know, more to me on a Twitter space. Uh, and I think like about a year ago and he, uh, you know, ended up just being very kind of thoughtful and developed this protocol and took his time and Raph was working with him. 
and eventually figured out the inscriptions aspect. He, he basically, you know, didn't just have the innovation of, you know, first in, first out tracking of Satoshi's with ordinal theory, but also introduced inscriptions, which is like basically the second most popular use case on Bitcoin is using it as a database now. So, you know, the protocol comes out in, you know, January of this year, and he releases it with the, the command line interface that was, you know, unless, again, unless you're like super, super, you know, technical nerd, you would need at least some set sort of command line interface for something to have some sort of opportunity to have a viral moment and really get the shine. And he, he released that product, like he packaged it all in a, in a really nice way and had the Explorer ready and gave it enough of a chance to, you know, have a few hundred people try it out. And it turns out there was something there. The idea, you know, obviously did have something behind it. And it turns out that, you know, even larger than just this idea of tracking sats and, you know, inscriptions, he was tapping into this much deeper, uh, there's just a lot of people who love Bitcoin. And like, if you found out, if you figured out a way to do Web3 on Bitcoin, they would have been like super excited about that. And Casey tapped into that energy. And of course, that's why you have people like Michael Saylor, uh, CZ, uh, you know, but even Vitalik, like, you know, kind of saying like good things and praising ordinals because everybody loves Bitcoin. Like everybody who's been around here a long time is a huge fan of Bitcoin and isn't really a fan of maybe the current, the current culture on Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is its Bitcoin itself and what it stands for, I think means a lot to a lot of people, like more so than anything else in this space. So I think Casey tapped into that because these people would love to be on Bitcoin if they could. There just wasn't any way that they were aware of to do NFTs on Bitcoin or do DeFi on Bitcoin or do, you know, any of these interesting things. And Casey opened that door for a lot of people. And that's, I think, the larger legacy there is, is really he's the one who opened that door, not only from a technical perspective, but a cultural perspective before ordinals. I think there wasn't really a group of people that was large enough to really create a safe environment where you're, you know, a developer experimenting on Bitcoin, you know, you don't want to be walking on eggshells when you talk to people. It's like absurd. You should just be able to like try tons of dope stuff, ship the product, you know, people use it. If it fails, that's fine. You know, move to the kind of next thing. Um, you know, most of these things are like really, you know, bad innovations and nobody cares about it, but Occasionally, somebody like Casey comes along and does something really neat. And Casey showed that, uh, you know, you can use Bitcoin to do this Web3 stuff. And there's a culture of people who are going to support you against this, like, kind of, you know, mob of, like, laser eye maxis who might harass you, uh, which is what would have happened maybe during 2017 through the, like, 20, 2022, essentially. Yeah, that's a good point. It is a turning point for the Bitcoin culture. I mean, one of the key takeaways I got from that was that, it's a good thing that he listened to your to your, your user experience um, suggestion to make it easier to use, right? Um, but so he would have probably done it anyways, to be honest. But I definitely <laughs> tried to convey like I have seen so many of like really cool old smart contracts with NFTs in them, and people are too lazy to go to either scan. Like no, you're right. I mean, people, until they get yeah, wrapped and put on OpenSea people, for sure. You have to make a user experience that people will use. Otherwise, people are just super lazy. Is is just the reality, right? Let me ask you a question. How did you know it was a good idea back then? Um, I mean, Casey's a pretty smart dude, and like you don't come across people that are thinking like this first principles at this level from first principles. So, you know, Bitcoin taking you know this currency turning into non fungible tokens. That was like just our like just objectively that was a way more interesting idea than like the 23rd metaverse product or something so uh it was just different and i'm a value investor a contrarian so i'm always looking for stuff like this and yeah this just instantly it was pretty pretty instantly obvious that uh this dude was on to something and i even have some messages i sent to a friend where i was like dude we need to set up a rare sat hunting operation like we we could be like the first ones to do this. Of course, I didn't end up uh, doing it. But yeah, I, I was pretty much after the Twitter space specifically, I was pretty much sold that, yeah, like I want to collect these things. There's probably a lot of people like me who would share that psychology. This would organically have traction. And we're, we're you know, starting to see like Magic Eden release their uh, rare sack uh, marketplace product today. Like we're seeing a lot of that early we're seeing a lot of the early ideas that Casey had and, and that vision just kind of playing out over the last year. 
almost to a T. <laughs> and wow. like the sat hunting specifically, like Casey explained to me that people are going to be, you know, sending Bitcoin to Binance, withdrawing it until all the Bitcoin on all the Bitcoin in the world has been sifted through for rare sats. And I was, you know, thinking like, dude, you're a little, little ahead of yourself on all this. Like, I don't think people are going to be sifting through all the Bitcoin. Of course, I have people, you know, telling me in my DMs, you know, there's probably like six people who've told me, yeah, I've, I've sifted through over a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin now. So we're seeing exactly this play out. And Casey, uh, yeah, Casey predicted it. Like, to what a, a visionary. Very much a visionary. Very, very thoughtful, smart dude that understood pretty much all aspects of this and has been able to predict most of it pretty, pretty well. But yeah, he, he's not only like a, a tech guru, but he understands human nature too. Um, and and how does all this uh, lead up to you creating attributes? Can, can you share with the audience what that is and where or.io comes in? And after that, let's open up the floor for questions. So if anyone else in the, in the audience wants to ask questions, uh, please raise your hand and we'll bring you up. So yeah, let's, let's, um, let's hear it. Yeah. So uh, I, I had had debate. I had, I had had a debate with Casey and uh, Adam McBride about like what kinds of stats would people want to collect. And I was definitely an advocate for like people who want to collect cool numbers like palindromes. And uh, I think we were, we were all in agreement that people would probably want to collect, you know, old stats or, you know, stats from interesting transactions. And then Casey was really, you know, adamant that people want to collect the first stat in a block. And there were just these different kind of, you know, categories of interesting stats that people might want to collect. And like, we were talking about this, like over a year ago now, just, just completely as an idea. And then ordinals comes out. It's all of a sudden super popular. People are all completely focused on the inscriptions. It's like, nobody read the handbook and like got the memo about the rare and exotic sat part. So, you know, here I am with Zach, we created this ordinal explorer where you're able to view all the inscriptions on Bitcoin. It's like a, you know, Google images for Bitcoin or something like this. And, you know, everybody's ignoring the rare and exotic sats. And like, there's like literally like three people, like Nolish and like two other people in the world that give a shit about the rare exotic sat stuff. And I like popped on a call with Nolish and was like, we should add some like discoverability. Like it's probably an interesting feature to know if your inscription is on a cool sat. Like maybe it's not worth anything, but if your inscription is on a sat that Satoshi owned, that's probably something that might be cool to know. So I basically sat down and, you know, Zach and I came up with this uh, idea of sat attributes where it's a combination of the word sat and attribute. So it's like trying to like people in the NFT space call the different traits and attributes uh, of an NFT, like an attribute. So it's taking that and applying it to a sat. So if a sat has an interesting property, like Satoshi owned it, or like it's a palindrome number, or it's from the Bitcoin pizza transaction, these are interesting attributes that we want to be able to index and, you know, associate with SATs. So yeah, we were the first ones to basically take all of these different categories. At the time, it was only uh, these five different categories in addition to Casey's rarity. And we indexed those. I did some research to figure out like which blocks Satoshi mined and also spent and was able to, you know, put out the first product for people to explore inscriptions on these SATs. Like we were the first ones to index that. And we created this kind of basic uh, coloring scheme and icons that, you know, have more or less become kind of this loose standard and people refer to them as like, you know, a block nine sat, like a pizza sat. I think it's like, this is all pretty logical. This would have played out this way. I think we were just the first ones to really, uh, you know, do it and, and try to make the standard and all these names have stuck to this day. Like, well, like I, I put a lot of thought into like that, you know, the block 78 stats that were mined by Hal Finney, the, the second oldest block uh, reward that's in circulation, you know, made the color of that icon of that attribute red. And I made it the exact color of the hue of his shirt in this iconic picture of him running when he was much younger, right? That's the, the kind of iconic Hal Finney picture. Oh, of, I see. You know, so basically created this, you know. I'm wondering where the colors picture. come from. Sorry, say it again. I was wondering where those colors are coming from. Yeah, there, I could I could go into detail on maybe more of this stuff. It might bore people, but bottom line was you need to create uh, instead of it just being this loose idea that like people are talking about and like Nolish might have been tweeting about. You need to like categorize it into a specific thing where there's a a clear line. I'm a, I'm not a fan of when I hear people talking about these different attribute 
potential statute categories and it's not there's not clarity like there needs to be a rule that is you know yeah. mathematical and programmatical that like this is the exact sats where it starts and ends like this is the cutoff this is the qualification for this sat and like people do these silk road sats now and i'm like what does that mean what is what does silk road sat mean like there are you know a third of the bitcoin in circulation has been through silk road there are like four <laughs> large moments where governments seized you know sats from silk road and that that name just doesn't mean anything to me. And if you ask people, they would say, well, it's this, this or this, but nobody has the same necessarily name there. So I think you do have to yeah. probably categorize that as well. very rare. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you need to be thoughtful about how you categorize these things. So I was like, we're gonna we're gonna kind of create these categories that I think are naturally the categories that should exist, and they're a clear asset, and you can, you know, see that if your inscription is on them or not. And, you know, people are now buying and selling these things and collecting them. So, um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's very important that attributes are very thoughtful about how you kind of implement this because these things do stick once you create them. And I, I think you don't want to be too loosey-goosey, uh, you know, just throwing this word like Silk Road sats around. I see people say that and I'm just like, this doesn't have any meaning to me. Like, there is no way that in five years there's like a category called, you know, Silk Road sats. Like, that's not, it's not going to be a category because that, that name doesn't, imbue any meaning like you could add to that name and say like you know silk road you know first auction by the fbi sats or something like this but yeah like when you say but, 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 that, you're right. this is yeah. really important right to keep people from like either getting scammed or like buying sats that are not actually rare <laughs> <laughs> if there's not well if you don't know like if there's not a if there cannot be an exact supply of the thing then that's probably problematic as this attribute category, in my opinion, right? Like there might be a ton of Bitcoin pizza sats, but we know the exact sat ranges of those Bitcoin pizza sats. And I can tell you the exact supply. And I think that's an important characteristic that when you're trading these things and collecting them, that matters. The reason we don't have how finny, like we were going to do a how finny attribute, right? Like a finny uh, similar to the Nakamoto's attribute. The reason we didn't do that is because the research of the blocks that, how mind is only about half done. I talked to the guy who uh, is like the leading researcher on this. And he said, yeah, like somebody needs to pick up my work and finish it. So we're not going to create a attribute category where, you know, in the future, some sat could have been a half any sat that like we weren't able to index. And then, you know, there's some earlier inscription on that sat that we just failed to index. So yeah, I think it's very important that, you know, uh, all of the sats that are in that attribute category and before it becomes like an official thing. Otherwise it's, I don't know. It's it's really hard to trade something with not knowing the supply, right? Yeah. And you put a lot of thought into like the palindrome one is like the mirror image and you use a butterfly. I think that's very fitting. So thank you for pouring your heart and soul into it. Thank but you I'm, for appreciating. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, for no, it's, it's really cool. It's really cool. I, like it's, it, I mean, we have to be able to, um, categorize things otherwise uh it's hard to understand the meaning and and uh, value of things but i mean like okay so you 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 spend all this time to create the system um but you know people aren't just going to adopt it i mean, like but i see it being adopted by like uh magic eden and some pretty big players like how how did you like how much time did that cost you you know to to um get them up to speed on this or was it just like they just did it themselves well, so it's interesting. We released the rare, the rare and exotic like attributes exploring on Ord.io in May. And it was like almost instantly a hit. Like instantly everybody was like, this is awesome. They were going, you know, checking out if their inscriptions were on an interesting sat. And I think just yeah, organically there was something there that even, you know, was more su successful than I had imagined. Uh people would care about it even more than I thought they would. So through that, I think, you know, everybody's seeing like, this is like an interesting thing. And, you know, of course I want it to be a standard that everybody follows. So, you know, people would reach out to me and I would give them, you know, like the different ranges for like pizza sats and, you know, share with people like how to do it. And, you know, people can figure it out on their own too. They, they like people can figure it out without talking to me, but um, it was just wanting to make sure like there was some sort of kind of reasonable standard so that we're, you know, being good stewards of what is essentially a brand new asset class. And, you know, for the most part, uh, different integrations from explorers and marketplaces have, you know, stayed pretty close to the icons and the colors and the names. 
And that's been like pretty cool to see. And there's even people that have, you know, added on, you know, even more attributes that are pretty cool. And we're going to be, you know, taking what, what they did and, you know, adding them into Tor.io. So it's now this pretty cool collaborative um, thing where there's people, uh, you know, experimenting with these different categories and, you know, seeing, seeing what the market likes and cares about and seeing what the market doesn't care about. Yeah, no, I mean, this is a side side note. I mean, first of all, thank you so much for putting on that work and making a great system that that is um, becoming basically the the generally accepted system, right, for uh, rare sets. Speaking of rare sets, this is a tangent. I'm only going to spend like 30 seconds on it, but hey, I, I we need to get your advice, right, because we, we are launching a, a um, the Ordinals collection, but only for... Um, our mentors like yourself, our speakers, uh, investors in our ecosystem that have contributed to the Bitcoin Startup Lab. Right now, there's a little over 100. And then all the all the startup teams that were able to make it through our three-month gauntlet and get to demo day, right? So it's going to be a private collection. Um, but yeah, we definitely want to pick the right rare set to uh, in inscribe it on. So so I'm going to pick your brain about that. Yeah. About that soon. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'm a fan of attribute layering. I, like to me, it's not necessarily how rare, you know, like I guess the, the supply and scarcity is obviously important, but to me, it's more like how cool of a narrative is that? Like, you know, if something was, if a sat was a pizza sat and it's a palindrome number, like that's interesting to me, right? Like the, the layering of different attributes is probably the kind of coolest area uh, that I'm interested in. I think, you know, a Satoshi uh, that, you know, Satoshi, a, a Nakamoto sat that Satoshi had mined and held. And, you know, that's also a palindrome. Like, that's like pretty badass to me. So I would say like, you know, those aren't even like necessarily super expensive. So, you know, you can kind of figure out the supply. Obviously, there's a lot of Nakamoto sats. Yeah, no, that, there's a lot less palindrome. There are some numbers that we want from the palindrome one that do have a narrative. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, three digit palindrome. They're like, dude, there's so many, I would say just like find the like coolest stats you can at a reasonable price that have like an interesting narrative and inscribe on it. Like whatever kind of resonates with you. Um, I, I think there's, there's definitely something to the Hal Finney and, and Satoshi um, stats that they held. There's something like super cool about that. So I, I think like having your uh, collection, you know, inscribed on those is just, even if it doesn't end up adding any value or anything, I think that's just like really cool. Like if you can choose to have your, you know, inscription on a sap that Satoshi held, like that is, you know, just objectively like super cool. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'll say, I'll say, yeah, definitely, definitely. I'll, okay, but enough of that, that, about that. We're, we're going to have a different X spaces just for that um, right around the corner, but let's, Let's go back. So you you create this awesome system that's saving people so much time. Attributes, um, you're spearheading that. A lot of people have contributed to it. Um, where does Ord.io um, link to all this? And then after that, we have um, Dogfather up here with his hand up for a question. Awesome. Yeah. So at Ord.io, we're like super focused on our Explorer product, right? Like we are an Ordinals aware Bitcoin Explorer. So that means exploring. Uh, not only inscriptions, but also rare and exotic sats. So, you know, we're cooking up some cool stuff in the the rare exotic sat category with attributes that I, I'm hoping we'll be able to reveal pretty soon. Uh, but also we've integrated these social features into the product that have been really awesome. So if anybody who's been to Ord.io, you know, you connect your wallet, you can start upvoting inscriptions. If an inscription gets enough upvotes, it'll show on our homepage. And then we released a few weeks ago, the ability to reply to inscriptions. So there's now a like conversation happening under every inscription. So taking all of these, you know, files on Bitcoin and then turning them into these interactive pieces of social content, it's a, you know, kind of an experiment that we're running that I think we're going to keep we're going to keep pushing on and I think there's some more interesting social features we can kind of roll out in that regard. So pushing on the social area, pushing on the rare and exotic stats area. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. Um let's let's take a Let's take Dogfather's um, question, and then after that, I'd like to learn more about who should who your strategic partners and and uh, who you'd like to invite into the fold to uh, make this like a a huge success. Uh, but first, Dogfather, your your hands up. You want to ask a question? 
Yeah, hey guys, uh, thanks for having me up. Uh, hey Leo, hey Albert. Um, a bit oh, you just you just cut out. Can you can you hear us? Leo, did it cut out? For oh, I can hear you. I can't hear Doge Father. Yeah, I can't. I can't hear. Would you? Did you hear him in the beginning? I heard him for like two seconds. Yeah. Yeah, me too. So, all right. So, so let me try it again without my, my headphones. Is that better now? Yes, much better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry for that. Um, yeah, big big props, Leo, to you and and Zach for building Auto.io. I think most of us are using that every day. So, really love that platform. And uh, yeah, just just uh, would be super cool to know. I mean, you are like builders, but this is uh, like a nonprofit uh, website for the moment. So, so, what are your plans for the future? I mean in terms of like, uh, what is the business model of the website? It's more like, uh, I mean, what's your runway? What are your plans? That would be super interesting to know. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, we haven't really focused on, <laughs> maybe this is being like bad business person, but we haven't really focused on like trying to make money or like we've had lots of opportunities over the past uh, like six months to, you know, do partnerships and like, you know, uh, basically have you know revenue streams and we've just decided to focus on just being you know we're really good explorer and maybe worrying about uh how we're going to make money in the future so yeah there's there's like lots of ideas like you know people have ideas that we could uh you know be an infrastructure product where our back end is this api that people could use and they could maybe pay us and we could be more of like an infura people you know obviously you know, use us and they're like, can I, you know, buy inscriptions on or.io? Like that's definitely a path that we could go in. There's, a, there's some potentially interesting, you know, things around subscriptions. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there, there's various ways you can definitely generate revenue. Um, I think the real opportunities we've had over the last six months was basically just us turning down opportunities to uh, kind of like tap into other people's APIs and, you know, take maybe a cut of like, uh, you know, an inscription fee or, um, you know, maybe pointing to other marketplaces or something like this. And we just decided we're going to kind of stay, stay exclusively or .io. Excellent. Todd Farr, you have a follow-up question on that? Yeah, I mean, I love that approach, Leo. I mean, this is really like uh, uh, pretty cool because, I mean, it's way better to first have a cool product out there before, you know, making money. So, and the more you can wait and the more you establish and the more functions you have, uh, the better uh, in, in the long term, if, if you have the funds, right, to 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 pay the DAFs and, and, and everything, you know, the run costs. So, really looking forward to what you're building. I, I You know, you, I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm also trying to build something like a social layer on Bitcoin, uh, a bit more on-chain, um, and, and probably we, we will have some, maybe some collab in the future. Really looking forward to, to what we are building. Yeah, Doge Father, I definitely respect the Friends Protocol and, you know, definitely uh, maybe when we have some, a few more engineers in the future, could more uh, kind of look into what an integration there might look like. Yeah, speaking, uh, speaking on topic of strategic partnerships, uh, what kind of, what, who are the ideal strategic partners of Ord.io? Well, there's this partner called uh, Zach and a partner called Leonidas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We haven't really like officially uh, like kind of done like partnerships with, uh, you know, people like any in any sort of like official capacity. Like I would say there's lots of collections where, uh, you know, they're inscribing their collection and they'll like message me and be like, hey, I just inscribed this. I'm letting you know first. And then or .io account is kind of this uh, kind of like we tweet out like interesting on-chain events that are happening. So we'll break the news on lots of. I don't know. I just see like cool, cool things when I'm scrolling through or.io and I'll tweet about it from that account. And when somebody like inscribes something for the first time or uh, a big collection that people are anticipating gets inscribed, we'll tweet that out. So have a great relationship with, you know, a lot of the, the different collections in the space and their founders, and then have, you know, obviously through the ordinal show and uh, just, you know, a lot of people use or.io and, uh, you know, just being a collaborative, you know, trying to be a collaborative company in the space, like, you know, working with, um, you know, Magic Eden, Ornals Wallet, just a bunch of people to kind of make sure that, you know, attributes are kind of being done across the board and like some somewhat sort of a decent standard. And I think we've, we've done a decent job at achieving that. Um, and I think uh, 
a lot of credit to all the other builders for you know trying to stick to something and understanding the bigger vision there. Super, super. And we're we're running up on time, and uh, I think there might be some builders and founders there. Uh, maybe even some that are thinking about coming into the Bitcoin fold. What's your what's your um, advice or your inspirational words for them? You know, it's... uh like practically speaking, go read the Lean Startup and then try to ship an MVP of your idea, you know, as quickly as humanly possible. Uh, that is like the definitely the approach. Uh, I see, I just, I, I even see post lean startup world, a lot of people spending a long time to build things and then releasing something that doesn't ultimately map to what people want. So yeah, go, go just try things. It's like a lot of people talk about things. Uh, a lot of people will then dive into something and then spend like a year working before showing it. What you should do is just go create a fun project over the weekend and like tweet about it and see if anybody uses it. Yeah, that's that's a quick and dirty way. Uh, thank you for those words of inspiration. And because we have we still have a couple of minutes left, I saw snorkels. He just came up. To <laughs> ask. I will take that as last question. And, and right. uh, yeah, perfect. Snorkels. Yo yo yo! What's up, brother? How are you? Doing? Hey, what's up, Snorkels? How's it going? Mm, I'm good, not bad. Well, I think it's been maybe like six months since I've talked to you on a space. Glad to hear you're doing well. Um, did you have like a question or anything? Or like, what are your thoughts on ordinals these days? Bro, you Bitcoin? You Bitcoin ordinals project? Yeah, yeah. So we're Ord.io is an ordinals explorer. Like, so it's you can think of it like as uh like a, a web browser, but for content that's inscribed into Bitcoin. It's a good one. It's a good name. Good luck. I love you, man. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. Awesome. So that's a that's a great um way to end this. How do people reach out to you and learn more, you know? My DMs are open. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. And thanks so much again for taking the time out and sharing your founder's journey to Bitcoin. I hope um, Leonidas is this story inspired um, many of you out there to come and build on Bitcoin. It's it's still early. It's early, it's early days right now. Um, just, um, but there are, there are more and more people coming from Ethereum space into the Bitcoin space. And if you're one of them, um, like rest assured, you are very competitive. Your, your knowledge that you gain, just like how you know, I took the knowledge he has from Ethereum and bring it to Bitcoin, it, it does give you a very big advantage. So if you guys are on the fence, uh, wait no longer, just jump in. Um, if you want to do it the quick and dirty way, like the United said, pick up a book of the Lean Startup and, and try to ship something this weekend. If you want an awesome community and if you want to go through a gauntlet and be challenged for three months and build an investment ready startup, sign up to the Bitcoin Startup Lab, you know, give a, give me a follow, give me a follow. And um, yeah, that's, that comes to a conclusion, our 16th episode for Who's Who in Bitcoin Innovation 2023. And thanks again, Leonidas, for your contribution on Satribute or Dio, and also, of course, uh, keeping, keeping the ordinal show going for so long. Um, that definitely has... Uh, saved me a lot of time just going there to check out what's the what's the the newest stuff happening right and as a compliment to that everyone we're creating a uh the bitcoin innovation shows on on, on thursday and if you're if you're a founder uh and you want to learn more about uh what pre-seed investors look for we also create a friday show it's called bitcoin uh money fridays where we usually invite one to two uh investors pre-seed investors and or accelerators to come talk about what they look for. So um, if you're looking to go down that route, that service is also a public service and hopefully that helps some people out. Thanks again, Leonidas, for joining. And thank also, you. Dude, thank you. Like, I appreciate everything you do for this ecosystem as well. Like, you know, supporting entrepreneurs is an incredibly uh, important, important aspect of this. And the, the accelerator, the hackathon, the Twitter spaces, like everything is, uh, you know, this is, this is super important for, uh, kind of ch ch changing the narrative and culture on Bitcoin. We need we need more people like you. Yeah, let's. I mean, let's continue working together. It's. Uh, I mean, it's an honor to hear you say that, um, and it it, it does bring uh, a lot of happiness uh, 
you know, warms my heart up. And also thank you for your staunch support, being a judge at the Hackathon, um, being a speaker for, for our students, being a mentor. So thank you again for your contribution all around. Thank you, Leo.